Bejeweled addiction sweeps the world. Atari classics are coming to phones. And companies are dying in droves. These stories and many more on this episode of the Video Game Newsroom Time Machine. I've been waiting a long time for a chance to say this. Stop the presses. Requiescat in pace. Make some crazy money. What is a man? It's me, Mario. What a mess. Get over here! Please save me. Welcome back to the Video Game Newsroom Time Machine, the podcast where we travel back in time to find out what was making headlines in the video game and home computer industries 40, 30, and 20 years ago. Today we're going to be traveling back 20 years to September of 2001. I'm your host, Carl, and I'm back with our first best co-host, Peter, welcome back, Peter. Peter, I won't say anything until you say say hi. Oh, Shit, no, okay. I said something. <laughs> <laughs> say hi, Peter. Hi. Yeah, it's been way too long, hasn't it? You even forgot our intro. Yeah, it's it, it has been too long. I mean, that terrible wannabe joke that we do. Uh, so, yes. <laughs> uh, what you been up to? I was a judge this week in the financial oh. court. A judge? Yes, I kid you not. So uh, explain this to me. Yes, so this is uh, one of the things of the German legal system. In some courts, like the social court or the uh, the, the financial court, um, on the lowest level, of course, you have uh, judges who are actually lawyers by education, and you have two judges who are more or less like the voice of the people. Who, of so, course, have to have some knowledge in this field, you know, and uh, yeah, I was a judge. That was cool. cool. Now, uh, time before, for me being in, uh, in a court. That was the first time you were ever in a court? Yes, yes, because oh, cool. I'm a citizen who behaves and whose company also behaves. So, <laughs> but this was the first time and I was the judge. So, it was pretty nice. Pretty in interesting words, case I cannot talk is, about. But in other words, what you're saying is you never been caught before exactly but excellent this is um, well yeah not the story entirely <laughs> um but no it was pretty cool i mean we were sitting there for like a three-hour session and i learned so much which was pretty nice um, wait the whole case was heard in three hours yeah but just a minor one wow okay and they had some uh stuff going on before that it was just the, the hearing where I was invited to, you know, and it's meant to be like, oh no, I'm degrading myself again, but it's meant to be like this, um, the the main judges, you know, they have a voice and I a vote and I have a vote and the other, well, basically ancillary judge has a vote and it's three judges who are coming from a uh, lawyer background and two judges who are well, not everyone can do it, but uh, it's like people in this field can do it. So um, so you had to have a specific uh, educational background in order to qualify to yes, you, sit on this well, panel of judges. Exactly. Yes, you have to have, in this case, you have to have some financial background, you know. Okay, that's interesting. So it's not quite the equivalent of the jury system, but at no. the same time, you had to have some qualifications in order to sit on this uh, panel. Exactly. Cool. Uh, yeah, that's that's pretty cool. And uh, did you make them burn? Did I make a burn? Yeah, did you make the people who were on trial burn? Did you send no. those bastards down? Did you... Uh, we, 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 we send our uh, finance ministry uh, down to hell. So it was pretty nice. Oh, okay. Uh, cool. Again, I cannot talk too much about this because I swore not to say anything. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. You're under an, an NDA, so to speak. Yeah, basically, yes. But oh, really it's too bad. Okay. Yeah, it is. It is. 
<laughs> Maybe over a cup of coffee, I'd talk to you about this case. Oh, definitely, I'll definitely. Talk to you on record. Oh, come on, yeah. It's, <laughs> I, I, I actually signed up to uh, sit on one of those panels way back yeah. in the day. And unfortunately, I, I moved to Switzerland before my number got called. Or uh, they called me up, but the date would have been after I had moved to Switzerland. And okay. then I had to tur uh, turn it down. Too bad because yeah. I was really looking forward to that. Oh, well. It's it's actually pretty nice, and you know, for me to see it from a point of view where I'm not the um, well, the, the guy who has to, yes, it's pretty interesting, you know, to get you used or to get to get to know the system, yeah, without anything bad happening to me, you know. So no, it was pretty no interesting. No consequences. No consequences. Basically, yeah. Uh, well, for me, <laughs> it had major consequences, but not for me. So yeah, pretty cool. Sweet. Well, yes, and, and it's the closest you'll get in Germany to jury duty. Yes, exactly. Mm -hmm. um, no, it was pretty cool. And awesome. yeah, uh, what have you been up to? We haven't oh, spoken uh, ever. Well, uh, the most exciting thing is that Monday I have to go back to uh, teaching classes on oh, site. Are you guys actually teaching in front of a class? Or is yes, still, um, yes, the, uh, yes. Type? They, they decided uh, just uh, last minute a couple weeks ago that we're doing it on site. And I'm just waiting really? for the first Delta variant breakout, which is going to, <laughs> uh, yeah, I'm basically... Like <laughs> and if you are listening to this in like 10 years and you're wondering what the hell they're talking about, just look up events of September 2021, okay? And uh, yeah, so we're going to be doing that. And apparently I am going to be responsible for checking everybody's vaccination cards and whatnot before every <laughs> class. I'm just like, you guys are going to be fucking kidding me. Uh, yeah, well, it's either that or everybody has to wear a mask in class. Well, guess which very and Carl is going with. Everybody's wearing the goddamn mask, and I don't give a well, shit. Of course. I mean, what you can do as well is like get a couple of COVID tests and like test every student. You know, no, I'm just gonna have everybody write their name <laughs> on their mask, and that'll be the end of it. <laughs> <laughs> Why that would solve the problem? Names? Well, because I can't even see most of your face, for God's sake. Uh, and I never remember any well, I mean, you can you can just require them to like print a photo of their face and put the <laughs> part missing on the mask. No, nah, because then they can't breathe through the damn thing. That nah, that doesn't work. I mean, That's you can really you can order That's those masks there. online, but yeah, no. Nah. We'll we'll fi we'll see just how long this charade goes uh but yeah that's starting on monday and uh, my other thing is i finally broke down and bought a uh one of those we bars for the uh, usb we bars uh so it's a basically does the same thing as the wireless sensor for a Wii and a gun and some Wii modes so now i got a light gun set up on my computer and i am happy what you doing with that uh, playing games like House of the Dead, Area 51, Terminator 2, uh -huh. the arcade game, Virtua Cop, uh, basically blowing stuff up with by pointing a plastic gun at the screen. It it, it feels good. It feels really good. So yeah. when your kid's like, Mommy, what's Daddy doing? <laughs> oh, he's behaving like you when you were two months younger. Uh, yeah, yeah, that's basically it. Yeah. <laughs> It's it, it's a lot of fun. I'm enjoying it. So, oh yeah, uh, yeah. I, I've wanted you know I've wanted a light gun my entire life. I've never had a light gun, so this was this was nice. This was a little treat to myself. You know what we we should do? We should record in uh, like sitting next to each other. Mm -hmm. So I could just drop by an hour earlier and we just shoot stuff. Dude, uh, I got two Wii modes. I only got one gun harness, but that's not a problem. We can play some House of the Dead uh, Overkill. It's it's one of the greatest games ever devised. It's. Uh, have you ever seen uh, the movie Grindhouse? No, I haven't. Okay, it's this weird double feature with little fake. Uh, trailers in between that's supposed to feel like really cheap 
action exploitation movies of the 70s back to back. Why do I have to think of Machete right now? Uh, because Machete actually started out as one of those fake trailers. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. But this was the one before it was uh, uh, Robert Rodriguez did one movie, Planet Terror, and Quentin Tarantino did the other movie, and I'm blanking on the name of it. The Tarantino one's okay. It's nothing great, but the Robert Rodriguez one is about a zombie apocalypse and this stripper who gets a giant assault rifle as as a as a leg after she loses her leg it's it's absolutely brilliant and uh house of the dead overkill tries to replicate the feel of that with each level of the game being introduced as if it's one of these cheap movies and the dialogue is as bad and cheesy as imaginable and yeah it's just awesome you know what we should not do what shouldn't we do the next time we have a movie night together with our well wives or girlfriend we should not watch this movie oh it's not a movie it's a game but you're right no, I, grindhouse I, I, is not a movie i mean, we should I mean watch the movie the girls yeah i mean i think kirsten would probably my wife would enjoy it but i, I do not think steffi is is ready for this i i don't think so <clears throat> for some no. reason no 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 <laughs> My wife listens to death metal music. This will not be a problem for her. Yeah. Stiffy is a different ball game. So, yeah. Oh, no. yeah, I mean. Yeah, we, we can't Yeah, a lot it. of advantages, but this is mm. one slight disadvantage. No, 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 no. We, we can't do that. But I, I highly recommend, if you're going to watch it, at least watch Planet Terror, because they release both of the movies in extended cuts later. But, uh, <laughs> yeah, Planet Terror is, is, is absolutely phenomenal. I love it. I love it to death. It's terrible. Machete but level but love terrible, it. but it, I love it. I love yeah, it so much. I mean, much. Machete, I love it as well. Have you seen Machete Kills? Yes, the sequel? of course. Oh, okay. It's the second yeah. one, isn't it? Yeah, that's the second one. I'm still yeah. waiting for Machete in Space. Yeah, I've, they I've they seen owe it. us the Machete in Space movie. Yeah. Um, however, <laughs> I like the first one more. Maybe because um, of the novelty. Uh, it, yeah, uh, yeah. I'm I'm a little torn on that just because second movies don't have to establish the characters and you can just do crazier stuff. And I think both of the movies work equally well. But yeah, the novelty of Machete was there. But since I saw Grindhouse before that, the novelty wasn't there. I needed, you know, that next level which Machete delivered on. But uh, mm -hmm. again, if you had seen Grindhouse first or had been familiar mm -hmm. with that kind of terrible movie, it's, yeah. It's, what can I say? I'm just going off on, uh, I'm getting lost here. We have stuff to talk about, especially because, and this is a nice transition, mm -hmm. one of the wonderful things we do here, uh, especially for our Patreon patrons who get a uh, you're not doing video this version of, of this. Uh, we were one just of our, talking about crappy videos, and now you want to introduce me playing video games as a crappy video? Thank no, you. No, Thank I, <laughs> the game this week has certain cinematic elements to it, which okay. might be put into this category. The All fact right. that you always play these games horribly <laughs> just is coincidence. So... Uh, Long-time listeners who, you know, <sighs> follow us here or uh, have seen my posts on Twitter and all this stuff, all the links in the show notes below, uh, will know that one of our weekly features is the segment where the co-host has to play one of the games that was reviewed in a magazine cover dated September of 2001. Now remember, when we talk about September 2001 for the rest of the episode, it's always the cover dates of the magazines or newspapers, so obviously the news yeah. happened at some point before that. It's a framing device. So, the game that you will be spending seven minutes playing in our segment seven minutes in heaven is none other than the amazing game by remedy max Payne. are you ready for some pain i'm so ready awesome
Welcome back, Peter, from your seven minutes in heaven. So, based off of your time with the game, describe to our listeners what is Max Payne? Well, Max Payne is a weirdly zoomed um, third person oh. action role playing game, I guess. Um, you are in the role of a cop, Max Payne, whose family gets killed in the very beginning of the game, and you shoot your way through the level. It kind of reminds me of GTA 3, um, graphic wise, and also like how, how you move your character or how you shoot. And uh, yes, you're a cop and you try to solve some crimes, and this is what I got to know in the first, well, I, it was actually 10 minutes of Max Payne. Very good. Um, now, I don't know if I'd call it a role-playing game. There's not like, you know, don't level up your character or anything, yeah, you don't. but an action, no, action adventure. Game, action game. Adventure action adventure game. This it, was the word I was looking for. There you go. Now, uh, when you said uh, weirdly zoomed, apparently you had some issues setting up the proper resolution for this old game on your modern machine. Maybe, yes. Maybe, <laughs> this, this was the Maybe I just well, bought a version that was weirdly zoomed. We'll never know. <laughs> no, no. I, I believe our Patreon patrons will see that, uh, yes, you, you cut off the bottom third of the screen and didn't know that your health meter was almost empty when you went around a particular Dude. corner. I mean, I just wanted to increase immersion, you know. And people shoot at you, you don't know when you die. It just do eventually. So, yeah. That's true. That's true. That's true. Okay. So, uh, what what is the story of Max Payne, uh, according well, to what you saw? According to what I saw, is Max Payne is a young cop who is happily married and they have a nice house and living the American dream with him being a cop. And he comes home and he, there are three guys who, I call them the uh, the triplets, and <laughs> they shot his baby and they shot his wife and this is what he finds when he comes home. And it's a, so it's According a happy, this, happy game. It's a happy game. It's, a, I mean, if you're a psychopath, yes, yeah, sure, it's a happy game. Um, if you're Max Payne, you're in utter pain after what you've seen. Um, huh, maybe this is why pain. Anywho, um, <laughs> after those events, Max Payne immediately transferred to the uh, to the DEA, the or DAA, the Drug Enforcement Agency. And he tried to get close to some mobsters or some drug lords. I didn't really get that. And then in the next scene, you are in an underground station and uh, you have the chance to wash yourself before shooting some other guys who kind of reminded me of the triplets from the very beginning. So I think it's the same game. Yeah. And did you notice the, the graffiti on the wall in the house was similar to the graffiti on the wall in the subway? Not at all. I just <laughs> admired the graffiti on the wall and I was like, this is a nice picture for which might be a fellow symbol in some other cultures. There was just a sword with some water coming out from the top. <clears throat> it was a needle. It was a needle yeah. in the letter V. Which makes way more sense, and my mind is way too dirty. Okay, yeah, because it, also in the cutscenes, uh, the comic book style cutscenes, they were talking about this yep. new drug called Valkyrie. V. Oh right, yeah, exactly. Thanks for reminding yeah. me. Um, yeah, there's this new drug called Valkyrie, and it yeah. has to get to the bottom of who uh, deals that stuff. Gotcha. And you would have actually gotten a good clue about that had you answered the phone at the house when you first arrived, had you found the phone when you first arrived. Yeah, the phone was just invisible to me. You know, I, <laughs> actually for a second I tried to find the answer cell phone button and then I was like, oh shit, no, it's 2001. So maybe not yet. Yeah, uh, and it's a game that uh, I think had you had the proper... Uh, resolution set and had you looked at the all the controls once you do uh, the the thing that really sets the game apart is the bullet time 
And uh, so you were playing it where you just ran around and started shooting guys, but that also meant that you took a lot of shots. Oh, and yeah. if you're, to... and, yeah, and and the way that the game is meant to be played is that when you see guys that you can attack, you and uh, you hold down a key that starts the bullet time, and now you mm-hmm. you can move you're basically moving at normal speed you're targeting at normal speed and shooting and everybody else is slowed down for that for a couple of seconds okay and, so you're basically doing a lucky luke style uh yeah basically moving faster and for yeah. everybody everybody outside of europe lucky luke is a uh franco-belgian comic about a uh, cowboy who is can draw faster than his shadow uh, oh all right and stuff. Yeah, sorry for anybody else yeah it's a comic book about a, a cowboy and very very popular they've made a ton of movies and blah 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 but yeah uh so the uh yeah so the idea is that and usually when you're doing the bullet time you can also jump so he's like doing these slow motion le- Keeps forward or to the side and shooting the guys, you know, at an angle and things like that. And it becomes a very strategic thing because once you used up your uh, your your bullet time, you have to wait for it to refill. So you can't just be using it all the time. And so what did what I didn't get to because it wasn't on my screen. How do you refill the bullet time? Do you refill it, it refills by automatically. Just waiting? Okay, just yeah, by just not using wait. it. By not using it, it refills automatically. Okay. But uh, so yeah, so when you have there's awesome moments. There's this one scene late in, late in the game where you're in this tower and there's a bunch of uh, there's these two big double doors, big fancy mm-hmm. ones leading to a uh, conference room, and there's all these mafia guys in the room. And they've all got their weapons and you can hear them talking about, you know, how they're going to kill you. And, you know, then they're having all these other conversations about other things going on and stuff. And you have two Uzis in your hand and you just slow motion leap forward and the doors fly open. And you can basically, if you're really good, you can almost mow down everybody with headshots in the room before you land. Okay. And so it's the classical you move so fast that every, everything just moves in slow mo. Yeah, it's it's sort of the Hong Kong action okay. movie feel. And the game does it Thank amazingly you, Alice. Yeah. well. So yeah, I, was thinking I, I do recommend going back and giving it another try. It's 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 a game that, yes, graphically is aged a bit, but <laughs> is uh is just atmosphere okay. pure. It's pure atmosphere. So Okay, that was our seven minutes in heaven. Uh, let's do our other obligatory stop over before we turn on the time machine and check in with our good friend Ethan to find out what I got wrong back when we traveled to August of 2001 in a little segment we call the Department of Corrections. Welcome back to the Department of Corrections, Ethan. Before we get into what I got wrong in August of 2001, we have... The Peter Comment. As as it is, as it is. <laughs> uh, and the, this one is another... Uh, it's a correction to Carl, while also commenting on Peter. Do not argue with the economics major who says that that is not perverse incentives. <laughs> Nobody would ever create a term like that, Carl. <laughs> <laughs> well, actually, um, why not? It's, it's perverse because it leads to a yeah, do not try to defend yourself that is on this. not no. an economic... Uh, it, it is not something that follows normal economic uh, rules of, you know... Adverse... Uh, Okay, shush, okay. Shush yourself. And 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 just to and just to tease you a bit. Remember me. Oh, <laughs> oh, oh. It's a good movie. Uh, amazing movie. All right, now we get into August 2001 Department of Corrections. Everybody put your hands down for I am the final authority up here in the Department of Corrections. 
You know, I, I just have to say this. There's an entire Wikipedia entry for perverse incentives, and it's exactly what I meant. Don't trust an economics major who's trying to give you English vocabulary when he doesn't natively speak English. Just say it. Shoot, Carl, shoot. <laughs> so uh, uh, you're talking about the the e-reader, and I just wanted to take this opportunity to highlight that uh, one of the first incentives of a relatively new preservationist group called Hit Save, run by Jonas Rosland, uh, has been preserving the e-reader cards in all their various and funky forms. So if you happen to still have e-reader devices hanging around, get in contact with Hit Save. That is all. Excellent. Uh, there will be a link in the show notes below. Lovely. And uh, next up, you said that uh, you're talking about the titles that use the PSX mouse. Uh, and you said Theme Park was a launch title on the PSX, but it was not. It came out uh, like 1996, I think. In- no, it came out uh, less than a month later. It was October, first week of October. I looked it up on the on uh, the. 95 is what you're saying, right? Yeah, uh, October so, of 95, yeah. Yeah, but was it, did the mouse, when did the mouse come out in America? I believe that was also out um, first day as one of the add-ons, wasn't it? I don't um, know. I don't think. But, I, I think but anyways, it was not was a launch cool. title. I don't consider launch window things to be launch titles. It has to come out the day the thing comes out. That is okay. the launch title. And I agree with that, yes. Um. Uh, and now we get into some historical speculation time. So this one's not a correction, but uh, you you were wondering about this thing between uh, Sega and Sony to do cross-platform between the Dreamcast and the PlayStation 2. Now, what, I, what I've observed from especially a lot of the stuff you've covered on your show is that Sega, at this time, when they were getting out of the consumer hardware. They seem to have been positioning themselves towards being a kind of service provider, is what I think. Yeah, definitely. Uh, you know, the because like, well, take the example of IBM. You know, pe- people are like, how could IBM still be a big company if you can't buy products from IBM? Well, because they went into the, like cloud computing and uh, data storage and all this stuff. They do stuff behind the scenes. They're still yeah. a name that you know, but uh, they do not have a, a front-facing product. That is not the be-all, end-all of a big company. Uh, oh, definitely. The same thing goes for the old navigation units like Garmin and stuff. They're huge in the shipping industry. Like, they run the logistics for warehouses and stuff, keeping everybody on track. But you just don't see it anymore because now you use your cell phone to uh, navigate. So you think... They must have gone out of business. No, they're just bigger than ever, and they don't bother with retail. Yeah, so that, I, I always like to caution people when they say Sega, uh, you know, had no chance when they got out of hardware because they, like, this seems to have been an accidental thing that Sega was very early in researching console connectivity. You know, the first with the Mega Modem. Uh, and then, you know, Se- Sega Channel and Sega Net and all this stuff. It-, it seems to have not been a grand plan, but I think by the time you're in the Dreamcast era, they have this idea that they're going to build an infrastructure that is going to be used by other companies. Uh, that just, like, it- it's something that's hard to prove because that is something that is would only be at the Japanese level because the American people wouldn't be involved with this kind of strategy because they were set up as a consumer apparatus. Exactly. And uh, we've already talked on the in the show in the past comments from the Japanese executives concerning things like the Sega Cafe, which was an online store for cell phone games in Japan. Mm-hmm. Uh, and also a bunch of other services that they were providing and they were looking at themselves for, as web portal or whatever else. And I think at this point, uh, this connectivity makes sense in that context as well as uh, just this nascent idea of there's going to be something on the web. And we need to be there if we're going to be a software provider. So, yeah, I completely agree with you. It makes perfect sense that that's the route they're trying to go. 
Yeah, it, you know, ultimately it doesn't pan out. They have, uh, you know, they diversify into different sorts of investments, like their big in, investment in entertainment more generally in Japan now. You know, the the you know the collapse and the Sammy buyout kind of changed their routing. But I, I really suspect that here in the early 2000s, Sega wanted to be a service provider, even probably more than a software company at the higher level. Oh, definitely, definitely. There, there is. Uh, actually, there's a story I cut from uh, the uh, from the, from the show that's about to follow this segment um, uh, for the September 2001, and it was a report, but I couldn't find any substantiation for it of Sega also getting into educational software and even creating a product that was going to be an earthquake simulator for uh for people planning disaster relief or whatever i mean it just seems so odd that i was just like there's i can't report on this because i couldn't find any references to it any place else uh but i really think you're right at this point sega doesn't know where they're going and they're just uh you know throw enough stuff at the wall see if it sticks and also smart enough to know through their experience of having had uh, an internet service running for the Dreamcast, that they have a basic idea of how this model works. I'd almost say it's similar to their Head Start uh, experience with the Sega CD, the Me uh, Mega CD, where they knew what the pitfalls of putting games on CDs were before anybody else, because they had did it before anybody else. Um, Turbo Graphics uh, CD notwithstanding, uh, and so they're they're coming into this year, these years, these early years, with a little bit more experience than everybody else. But I don't think that they're going to know how to capitalize on that knowledge. So you know that that's just something I, I want to keep in mind because just pe people lament the fall of Sega, and it's like, oh, they were they were doomed as soon as they got out of hardware. Now they had they had strategies and now they're doing uh, very well as a company now. But, you know, yeah, that's a different a different perspective of what they were thinking of back then. Definitely. All right. Now we have a, a, a guest department of corrections from a longtime viewer of the show. Listener. Listener. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe they watch it on YouTube and just stare at the artwork the entire time. I don't know. And it is beautiful artwork. <laughs> I don't think enough people see that I make an individual image for every episode. But oh. I do. I see them. Oh, thank you. <laughs> so, so this is from Lawrence. Lawrence. And I hope I'm pronouncing that right. I've only ever emailed with a guy, but I've been emailing him for years now. So, hi, Lawrence. <laughs> And yes, uh, Lawrence wanted to make sure that I clarified that Nokia is Finnish and not Swedish. I definitely misspoke on that one. Ericsson is the Swedish company. Yes, yes. And since we're talking uh, international companies, uh, let us, uh, you were talking about NCSoft, about how uh, Richard Garriott was pumping up uh, lineage, and you said... You said just as a broad statement that this never amounted to anything, but of course, part, getting uh, employed at NCSoft started the first part of the development of what became Tabula Rasa, uh, as they were trying to do a Korean-American co-development at the start. Gotcha. So ultimately, I was correct. It didn't lead to anything. Just kidding. Just kidding. <laughs> Tabula Rasa. Well, I mean, they, they you know released something based on that work. Uh, it was not what they envisioned, but that's that's a story you'll tell eventually. Oh, so. yeah. Oh, yeah. The launch of Tabula Rasa is going to be an interesting one. Yeah. Um, and you were wondering if uh, the third Thief game, Deadly Shadows, was released under Ion Storm. Yes, it was. Yeah. And uh, I'm going to, uh, yeah, uh, talk a little bit more about that. Well, we talked about it last um, episode already with that. Ion Storm Austin is going to keep its name. So, yeah, 
It's, uh, uh, but as, as you were talking about the Ion Storm name, you you went completely counter to like so much what of what you've said in this podcast before. It's like, well, Ion Storm is just a name. They don't know Ion Storm. They just know Deus Ex. But you have talked numerous times about how you see companies and you were like, oh, I'm going to buy their games. So I, I, pick, pick I've lane, said that Carl. for developers. I've said that for certain yeah. developers. And uh, Ion Storm is a developer. They're not a publisher. Yeah, yeah, I, 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 I get your point with Ion Storm, uh, and considering that Ion Storm came out of the gate with three relatively weak titles, um, I don't know if anybody was like looking at Ion Storm going, "Oh, I like their last four games. I'm going to buy the next one." I mean, Deus Ex is a pretty powerful, just like tentpole to have there. So. Well, yeah, but Deus Ex doesn't come out. That's like game five of theirs. I mean, you've got uh, what's the list of games? There's that Anachronox. weird strategy. There's a weird strategy game that comes out before Daikatana. Then there's Daikatana. Then there's Anachronox. Um, or Anachronox actually, I think, comes out slightly after Deus Ex. You're right there. No, so I, thought, Deus, I, I thought it came out before, uh, but I can't remember. Yeah, I can't remember the order. Uh, Deus Ex, I think, comes out before Anachronox. Not and not by much, oh. but it comes out before. Well, I, I will say that there's plenty of people who uh, look at companies and they just like them based on the one game. So this is I true. don't think this that w- true. I don't think that would be a deterrent. But yeah, that's just. Just just be careful with your words, Mr. Carl. Otherwise, we'll be back here in the Department of Corrections. I will be careful. I I find myself chastised. Thank you. All right. And finally, last of the list, you're saying that uh, the Ratchet & Clank movie came out, and there hadn't been a Ratchet & Clank game for a long time. Well, actually, the the reboot got uh, launched with the movie. Oh, really? Yeah, it was at the exact same time, and actually all the cutscenes, all the pre-rendered cutscenes in the game are the movie. It, I did, it, wait, there was another movie, uh, game before uh, this new one, the one with the gates in the parallel universe or whatever it is? Yeah, it was just called Ratchet and Clank. It was a reboot of the first game. Oh, I totally missed the fact that that game came out. Yeah, 2016. Okay. Hey. Yep. Came out at the exact same time they did a, a theatrical release of this movie, which bombed pretty bad. Um, and yeah, I, I love the fir- the first three Ratchet and Clank games. I love them. Um, yeah, me too. I, me too. Huge fan. Uh, I pl- like I especially Ratchet and Clank three. I played the arsenal off of it. You know, to to, to have a little, <laughs> little pun in there. You know. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> oh, I'm so bad, but yeah, uh, the. The, even though Ratchet and Clank hadn't been a super relevant franchise for a very long time, there was a game to support the movie. So okay, you. and that I completely missed uh, missed that one. So I thought it was just the movie, and it was like, seriously, guys, this is a little late. <laughs> then again, that movie, pro, uh, well, I'm not sure. I've got to look up the timeline, but I think the failure of that movie was what finally put the nail in the coffin of the Sly Cooper movie movie that was also in development i don't know what the what the plan for that was i mean the, yeah the release plan on the ratchet and clank movie was bizarre because like i said the cutscenes in the game are the movie <laughs> so if yeah, you wanted to have both it's just you just buy the buy the game uh and yeah <laughs> so <laughs> wow okay yeah yeah weird Okay, so I think we are done here then for yep. this a leap, and we will see you again in two weeks for our next Department of Corrections. Everybody single file out of the door. Goodbye. Bye. You know, I think last uh, during this last episode, Ethan gave the most important correction ever. I'm afraid to ask. Which one was it? <laughs> Do not argue with an economics major. <laughs> <sighs> Only when the economics major has it wrong. Yeah, hey, I still have a said, business don't degree. argue with an economics major. <laughs> I still have a business degree, okay? <laughs> I, I, I can hold my own to a certain extent. Exactly. Uh, <laughs> 
can't okay. wait to stop. I'll just pick it up and move it along. There you um, go. Speaking about moving along, let's start, I would say. Let's start yes. with the podcast. Let's turn on the time <laughs> yes. machine. Let's turn on the time machine and do what everybody's actually here for. Let's yes. travel back to September of 2001. Nintendo's GameCube system. We're unveiling the Xbox. 2001. This is a computer game. Welcome to September of 2001. Peter, what's our first story? Our first story is so 1980. Sega debuts new coin ops in an industrial park. In a sign of the trying times facing the coin-op biz, Sega has invited journalists and industry folks to its headquarters in New Malden in Surrey to view its latest coin-op fair. While many of the games are excellent, such as Wave Runner and Virtual Fighter 4 running on the new Naomi 2 board, the days of lavish premieres and exotic locales are no longer viable. No, they are most certainly not. You know, I'm asking myself, did uh, Sega actually gain anything out of Wave Runner or Virtua Fighter 4? Oh, yeah. I mean, these were still successful arcade games. They were still making money. Uh, they okay. just weren't making the massive, massive money that the arcades used to make. Uh, increasingly, at this point, the arcades have lost their relevancy. I mean, you're talking about yes. the era of the PlayStation 2, the Naomi 2 board. It's going to look good, but the difference in the graphical quality between the arcade and the home has mm. all but disappeared at this point. Yeah. And Wave Runner is one of these games where it's supposed to be a, um, a jet ski simulator. So you're actually standing mm. on a jet ski. And, you know, you're pulling oh. it up and down in order to move. And what you see on the screen is almost a first-person perspective. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is actually pretty cool, and this totally justifies, at least for me, the coin of business. Well, yeah, the only problem is that this equipment gets more and more expensive, and at the same yeah. time, when you're charging a buck, buck fifty-two dollars a play, and the play only lasts a couple of minutes, how many times are people yeah. actually going to play it? So yes, it's... Exactly. It, it's How many getting people harder are actually going to play it? Exactly. And now, you know, you're getting more specialized. We've talked in the past how places like, uh, the, well, very specialized uh, arcades are developing. You've got, like, arcades built for adults, you know, with bars and stuff and the games. Yeah. That kind of thing is popping up more and more. But, yeah, it's it's just becoming an almost untenable mm -hmm. business model, especially yeah. given the high price of these almost amusement park attraction-style game mm -hmm. units. Yeah, and also they eat away much more space. Exactly. And so this is not something that you're going to be popping into a convenience store, you know, in the back corner yeah. or even at a gas station or something. These yeah. are devices specifically developed for these family entertainment centers or the larger arcade facilities. Exactly. And I mean, even if you crank up the price to a dollar for a game, you know, the revenue per square meter, I think it stays the same. Oh, it drops even. I or mean, or all that, exactly. Yeah, it, it's dropping. And these things cost a lot of money. And remember, now you're not just having to replace a joystick occasionally. When the this hardware breaks down, we're talking mm, lots and lots of physical components yeah. that can break down. And it's not uncommon to walk into an arcade and you see these amusement style machines that don't really work properly, you know, force feedback on a light gun way at work or, you know, the hydraulics on one side of the equipment isn't working properly. It's just maintaining this stuff becomes extremely expensive. Yeah. I mean, I always have to think uh, when you talk about this kind of stuff, I have to think of this uh, soccer game you ta told me about where the, where the football actually was totally destroyed and you basically just hit a, a metal um, 
plate. Yeah. Metal rod, I want to say. Yeah, it was a metal. It was a flat piece of metal because they had put this half a soccer ball in the front that you were supposed to kick, to, and it would measure the force that you were using. Uh, mm-hmm. And yeah, that's that's exactly the kind of maintenance problem that develops with these kind of games. And it's yeah. it's sad because I mean they're amazing experiences. I mean it's, I I put way too much money into a game called Alpine Skier which was a game by Namco. Essentially, it was using a slightly souped-up version of the PlayStation 1 hardware, but you actually stood on these little... Pe- uh, on on this pedestal-type thing that you put your feet into, and you could move your feet, uh, tilt them left and right, and you could move the entire board left and right on like a 30- or 40-degree angle, Mm-hmm. And you held on with things that looked like skis, and what you had was a first-person view. You, I think you could also switch it to a third-person, so you saw your skier, but you could also do it in first-person on this big screen in front of you. So it was actually, it felt like you were going down this hill uh, on skis, and you controlled how you moved with your feet. Uh, it was a surreally immersive experience but Mm -hmm. it was one of those ones where as soon as the stuff started breaking down it it just kept breaking down and repairing it was probably not cheap no 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 yeah i mean also this equipment they use is so specialized and you can't just buy it from those guys i mean yeah with the chips it was the same but but still um yeah. Yeah. I mean, economically, and the standard, it doesn't make sense. Yeah, the standard controller—that's the standard thing. That's why fighting yeah. game like Virtual Fighter stick goes out, the key, uh, the buttons go out. You can get the replacements anywhere, but the specialized stuff becomes very, very expensive to maintain. Very expensive to get the parts and everything else, and so it's more or less you have. A big arcade, you're going to have a couple of these units sort of to attract people, but you're really making your money off of the fighting games and mm-hmm. the, the simpler uh, action games that is really where the profit margin is. Oh, yeah. Yeah. But. Hmm. Speaking of profit margins, <laughs> the world goes bejeweled crazy. A simple little puzzle game has begun to take over the life of gamers and non-gamers the world over. The simple game is raking in cash for publisher PopCap, which is giving time-limited versions away for free, like on this month's Computer Gaming World cover CD, or through their website with a $20 registration fee unlocking the game. They're giving it away for free, except for the the registration fee. Well, they're giving it away for free, but it has a time uh, cap. So ah, you can okay, only so play after. for like 20 minutes so. or so per game. And yeah. and then, and then you know, oh, this is your high score. Congratulations. But if you want to keep playing even further, then you have to get the registered version. And they're developers and they develop that stuff and they want to be paid. Yeah, <laughs> imagine that. So it's almost like a shareware version at this point. Yeah. You know, what? it's interesting to me is, I mean, this is one of like Candy Crush and stuff. And uh, so stuff that you find on like every other mobile phone. And there weren't any smartphones back in 2001. It's not to the extent that they were able to play that. Uh, that's the thing. The uh, the phones. There's no smartphones as we know them today, but you do have yeah. the Java phones coming in, uh, and this will be a breeding ground for this type of game. But this is really coming out of the era of games embedded on websites. So people, okay. you know, sitting in the office, they could surf the web a little bit and they'd come to a website and this was the kind of thing that you could implement in java or some other a very very basic programming language uh or using adobe flash so people could suddenly have a game running on their work pc without having to install something which was probably not going to be allowed or mm-hmm. was even blocked 
And it's a simple enough concept that everybody could get into it. And it was very, very addictive. You know, it had that okay. that flow to it. So, mm -hmm. uh, yeah. So, hey, honey, how was your work today? Oh, wonderful. I, I, I reached another high score. Exactly. It was better than playing solitaire. Let's put it that way. <laughs> Those dudes, they should work at work. Uh, they should, but, you know, everybody needs a break from time to time. You know, sometimes it's more productive to just play a game. That's true. <laughs> <laughs> Very much so. Oh yeah. Okay, um, but we talked about those games not coming to cell phones. However, the Atari 2600 classics are coming to cell phones. UK developer iPhone with that's with an F, not to be confused with the iPhone with a PH, will be porting several titles to Java 2 Micro Edition enabled handsets for a fee of about 35 cents each. In an Apple model, model or you just pay for a game? Uh, as far as I could tell from looking at uh, copies of their website, uh -huh. Uh, through the Wayback Machine, they were selling them individually, but there okay. may have been like a hub program that you had to install first. Okay. But yeah, they were selling them for about 35 cents each. This is actually pretty cheap. And how did they get the license? Uh, I don't know where they got the license from, uh, especially since that's a little bit up in the air at this point, but I'm guessing they just bought it from the license holder, which would have been Infogram at this point. So uh, remember, we talked about this months ago where mm -hmm. Infogram bought the rights to the Atari label, as yeah. well as a few others like Microprose from uh, Hasbro Interactive mm -hmm. when that was dissolved. And so I can imagine that they just bought the license there and uh, that now they're just porting it to all these different cell phones. Now, remember, this is the day and age before iOS and Android when every phone had a completely different resolution. Oh, yeah. Uh, very different processors and everything else. So even though you had a standardized programming language in Java, you still had to adapt each program for a new phone. And uh, if you go to the old website, I'll put a link to it on in the show notes, just seeing the massive lists of which cell phones each of the games has been ported to mm -hmm. is just insane. I mean, I remember this uh, these days and it's hard to imagine that we went through that. Mm. So, yeah. You know, thinking of that, I always, I always have to smile um, because I'm getting pretty nostalgic. <laughs> um, because back in the day, I will not say when, um, I had an old phone from Nokia. And I had a, an, an application for it where you can play Game Boy games. And I remember playing, sitting in math class and playing Pokemon games because I was just bored. <laughs> I can honestly say <laughs> that in law school, we all had to have laptops and I may or may not have been playing a lot of Super Mario Kart <laughs> uh, in a Super Nintendo emulator oh, really? in the middle of tax law class. Yes. Okay. Uh, <laughs> not saying that I did, not saying I didn't. I'm just saying there's a high likelihood that that did happen. So, yeah. Oh, man. Ah, the good old days. Days. Yeah. Anyone. Talking about good old days, Infograms is about to become Atari. Infogram has announced that it will be publishing several of its upcoming titles under the Atari label that they now own after their acquisition of Hasbro Interactive, which we discussed in our January 2001 jump. So, guys, we got the brand. We might as well use it. Yeah, um, okay. and you know, but but still, I mean, Infograms was a big name back then. So why did they choose Atari, the company that is basically dead? 
Well, because Atari was an even bigger name. At this point, Infogram, remember, we've been talking for the last two years about how Infogram is on this massive purchasing spree. They've bought a ton of different developers and publishers. Uh, they've been spending a ton of cash. But what yeah. they haven't really successfully been able to do in the last few years is launch any of their own IP. There's no game series or brands that are really associated with Infogram the way mm -hmm. like, you know, anything with Sid Meier's name on it was Microprose or yep. King's Quest was Sierra yep. or the Madden series was Electronic Arts mm -hmm. and so on and so forth. That hasn't happened yet for Infogram. They they had alone in the dark early on, uh, but a lot of classic games came out through Infogram, but nothing really stuck or became a property. Atari, on the other hand, is a well-known commodity. Yeah. A lot of people know the name Atari. They're going to release a ton of collections of old Atari games. Because remember, what they purchased wasn't the Atari Arcade division, but the uh, Jack Tramiel Atari Corporation. And what uh, Jack was holding on to was the rights to the home computer and console versions of all the old arcade machines up until, I believe, 1984. So a lot of those games are going to get repackaged and repurposed, as we saw now with uh, the iPhone deal in the UK for cell phones. And so I guess in Infogram, it made sense to relabe and rename themselves Atari. At the news announcement that I'm referring to here, they're really just talking about releasing some games under the Atari label, but very quickly they're going to shift and just use the Atari label for a couple of years. Okay, good for them. <laughs> oh, I know what's happening. What's happening? Oh, crap. Okay, some places there's a short, and so your audio is sometimes coming out of the microphone that's built into this thing, and sometimes it's coming out of the... <laughs> okay. Uh, talk now. I'll talk now. I'll talk. Okay, about it okay, okay. This should be good. This should be good. Wonderful. You were going to ask a question. No, I was not. I actually wanted to move on to eb1.com. Okay, then let's move on to eb eb1.com. Okay, so we are in the .com bubble. eb1.com brings online game rentals to your PC. Electronics Boutique, the software retail giant, has begun offering online rentals of PC titles over their eb1.com website. For $4.99, players can rent a new game for 72 hours. The system would unfortunately fail fairly quickly, but quite a few high-profile publishers like Infogram and Microsoft would sign up to the venture. I mean, this to me seems like something that was way ahead for its time. I mean, how did you get the game? It was surely not a streaming service, so you had to download it, I guess? Yeah, yeah, you would download it through their program, uh -huh. and uh, that was supposed to control you not being able to use it past a certain time. So okay. that their program would be a gatekeeper for the uh, for the rental. Okay, and resetting your system time? Uh, I'm fairly certain it would be checking back at the server okay. to use the server's time. Yeah, okay. okay yeah, good. yeah. I mean, that would be too too simple to bypass. I mean, it's uh, 2001, you know? <laughs> yeah. Well, the only problem is 2001, so many people didn't have high speed yet at home. that, And, and with the size of the games getting bigger, it, this was <laughs> a recipe for disaster. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And I guess eb1.com didn't live for a long time. No. No, um it, it's it, it's in and out fairly quickly. I uh, I tried to pinpoint an exact time when they shut it down, but uh, they yeah, it it's there for a few months uh, more or less and then uh 
they 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 just sort of drift away from this concept okay yeah it would have been fun had it worked but you know just not there yeah way too early exactly yeah moving on zugi if you never heard of them brings gambling to video games zugi is an online chat system for from zootech bv out of the netherlands Okay. In appearance, similar to chat apps like AOL, Messenger, and ICQ, the app allows for players to agree on wagers for online games, deposit the funds with Zugi through prepared credit cards, and then report back to Zugi who won or lost the round played on a completely different platform. An eBay-style rating system is meant to identify bad actors and help the community police itself. Huh. Okay. Yeah, it's... Yeah. Um, <laughs> I don't know. I mean, this concept. Why would you need another platform? You know, if you play, like, online poker or something, the platform where you play the game actually is able to... Um, and the well, the, I, the idea here isn't that you're going to be playing a game like poker. The idea here would be, hey, I bet you five bucks I can beat you at a game of Quake. So okay. what you would do is you'd go on Zugi, say, hey, I bet you five bucks on Quake. We each send five bucks to Zugi. They hold it in escrow. Mm hmm as a as a third party and then we would go and play quake and when once we were done whoever won we would then go and tell zugi hey player one won and then zugi would send 10 bucks to player one that was the concept here so two questions first yes how does Zugi earn money if they pay out the entire sum that's been paid in previously? Uh, I couldn't find any details on this, but okay. my my educated guess would be that they take a percentage off the top. All right, makes sense. Yeah. And then question number two. I'm wondering about whether or not it's legal to act like Zugi. Well, this is the beauty of being in the Netherlands. <laughs> all right you can basically do whatever exactly exactly now uh as far as i can tell even though there were several write-ups about this company in uh, different forums and, and different uh, magazines or websites uh, i couldn't find any mm -hmm. real information on the mechanics or what the company did beyond that it was supposed to have a launch date of may 14th of 2001 and there were a couple of press releases and the last version of the website that archive.org has is from june of 2002. Mm -hmm. so you know it, it if it did last it lasts a little bit more than a year but uh i had no recollection of this website uh, or this service popping up and i don't think that it really found an audience oh man those dot com times. Weird. Yeah, the dot com boom. I mean, already at this point, the dot com boom is actually busted. But you still mm -hmm. see a lot of these companies that, I mean, remember, we're looking at publications dated September 2001, which means there's a lot of this news that's out of date or coming very late. Like yeah. these guys launched in May, but they're talking about it in the September issue of computer gaming yeah so there's always this massive delay with when the news shows up uh given the format of the show but at least it shows us a little bit of the chronology of when these things happen yeah weird times let's just go back to the roots and also back to the roots gets highlighted in micromania oh very nice i like how you pronounce that so, Spanish gaming mag Micromania has highlighted the emulation site back to the roots. The site was a massive archive of disc images for the Amiga with both games and demos that would later switch to a legal format only posting games that they had cleared with the original copyright holders. 
Sadly, it would become a victim of its own success with the costs of hosting rising as bandwidth increased and ultimately selling to Candybox. So those guys basically started out pretty illegally and then they became legal and then they were so good that they had to sell because they were too successful to make any money. Uh, basically, yeah. I mean, what happened was a weird story. <laughs> in those early days, uh, the number of people who were really using Amiga emulation just, I mean, they were still in their infancy. Amiga emulation still took quite a bit of muscle to do properly. And well, uh, once they became known as the place to go and get legitimate uh clean versions of a lot of these games it just they just got pounded by people look downloading stuff mm. and uh you know you got to pay for that bandwidth somehow and i i do re seem to recall them getting donations and so forth but it just wasn't enough uh, this was also, remember, as, as the dot-com boom busts and the, uh, the money that you could make off of advertising went down to almost nothing, suddenly you needed different, uh, different types of income sources for uh, websites and something like this just wasn't going to work. Okay. Yeah, sadly, because it really <laughs> yeah, was I mean, great. It was a good idea. It was a good idea, but oh well. Uh, talking about things that actually worked eventually, uh, Game Boy Advance gets emulated. The pace with which emulators are catching up to consoles is increasing at a breakneck pace. PC Zone Magazine has a lengthy discussion of emulation this month, noting in addition to all the classic arcade and console titles, the still active N64 and just released GBA have emulators, albeit with limited cap compatibility so far. But I mean, the uh, cap capabilities, surely they were increased because in later Game Boy emulators, you can basically play, play everything. Oh, of course. I mean, but remember, the GBA just launched a few months yeah. ago. And this is so weird, isn't it? And this has never happened before. I mean, uh, big, full-blown emulation mm -hmm. of consoles and handhelds. Really, I, I, I mean, obviously, there were emulators way before this. But so when we talk about console and handheld emulation. We really have to go back to about 94, 95. That's when sort of the modern era starts, especially because the internet distribution really makes the whole thing viable. Yeah. Uh, and while there were emulators before that, I mean, it was a different, it, it, the internet changes that. Oh, so, I mean, we've talked on this show about the first PlayStation emulators coming out but they came out three four five years after mm -hmm. the console launched yeah. uh and the game boy of obviously also gets an emulator but you know that launched in 89 mm -hmm. so we're it's it's taken a while for the emulators number one to get up to speed and everything else this gba emulator is the first time that an emulator is hitting literally you could say within the launch window, within the first 12 months of the, of the system being on the market. And the fact that it's not quite working yet, uh, not everything about it is working, isn't really that big of an impediment. Uh, we saw ROMs for the, uh, for the games popping up literally at the same time the games were coming out. And okay. uh, the GBA really is one of these watershed moments in emulation, or at least it felt like it at the time, because it was happening at the same time as the game. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, I actually never owned a GBA, but I did end up buying several cartridges because I ended up playing the games on the emulators, and when I really liked a game, I'd go out and actually buy the cartridge. Because I oh, wanted to you were soul. <laughs> I wanted to support the creators of the games that I really like, so I ended up buying the cartridges. 
Uh, but there was no way in God's green earth I was going to be playing them on a GBA. I wanted to play them on my PC, nice and relaxed, large screen, bright, which mm -hmm. the original GBA wasn't. Yeah, uh, you were so too I old for hardware. that. <laughs> exactly. I, mean, I didn't it's... need the hardware, but what I wanted was yeah. those games. So I ended up buying a whole bunch of GBA cartridges uh, yeah. because I wanted to support the creators. The joy of having a handheld and on a long car ride, sitting in the car and just playing games. It's like the car ride I was is eight already, hours. No. Why is it only eight hours? Can it be 12? I was, I was old enough to be the driver, so that didn't help exactly. me much. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. But, um, yeah. Oh, yeah. And I mean, uh, obviously, it's going to take a long, long time for P uh, PlayStation 2 to get proper emulation. It's going to take a long, long time uh, for a lot of these consoles to get emulated. Oh, yeah. But, uh, you know, it, it was one of these moments where suddenly especially the rights holders suddenly took notice and were like, hey, wait a sec, this is wait something we have second. to worry about. We need making it. Exactly. Any money here. <laughs> exactly. All right. Exactly. All right. I mean, it's not only the Game Boy Advance that gets emulated. Also, Pinboy, Pinball gets the emulation treatment. In the same PC Zone article, Visual Pinball, the freeware program that allows the community to recreate classic pinball tables on their PCs, gets profiled. The creator, Randy Davis, is even cited on his inspiration for creating the software. Together with VP MAME, an offshoot of MAME that emulates pinball display and control hardware, the possibility of bringing real pinball to the home is endless. Yeah, it's still not the same. It's not the same, but if you know you go the extra mile and you build a cabinet, and nowadays Ooh, you do that pick up something <laughs> like you know, the Xbox, uh, what was it called? That little visual, the little camera thing that you put on top of the Xbox. Uh, ah, yeah, the, uh, they tried to get us all uh, to use. I think that failed so miserably. Sorry, did Connect. you guess the name of it? Yeah, I was trying to think of the name of it. It's the Xbox oh. Connect. Yeah, yes, connect. Uh, you can hook one of those up to your PC and actually have it track your head motion so the perspective on the, on the glass changes so that you always get the right perspective. I mean, things like that. I mean, they've gone crazy with uh, visual pinball over the years. And uh, the number of tables that have been recreated in it is also astonishing. And I mean, I use it for my... Uh, virtual pinball table, which is actually right next to me as I'm recording this. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, yeah, it's it, it's starting now. Obviously, visual pinball is a much older program than this. It's been around for years at this point. Mm -hmm. But this was one of the first write-ups I found uh, found up for it in a magazine. I thought definitely worth mentioning the fact that it's it's getting this kind of exposure. Mm. And. Do you think that pinball emulation is a successful thing? Oh, definitely. I mean, you can even buy licensed virtual tables nowadays. Huh. Oh, yeah. I mean, uh, the a lot of the old tables have been recreated in programs like Pinball Arcade and uh, uh, Pinball FX. Uh, there have been uh, countless... Uh, I mean... The digital pinball arena, this whole genre of digital pinball, both fantasy tables, so tables that are created just for these programs as well as recreations, it's a huge business. Uh, just a couple of years ago, Pinball Arcade, which had the license for most of the big, famous, old arcade uh, pinball games of the late 80s, early 90s, uh, they lost the license to Pinball FX, then they relaunched all of those games which is a bit of a pain because now i've got you know both of the programs installed because i've got some of uh, some of the game, uh, tables i've already purchased on one program some of the tables i've purchased on the other program and i have to sort of mix and match when i want to play my pinball but uh no it's extremely successful I, I play pinball probably as much as any other game on my computer so not really 
<laughs> no, no, no. I, uh, I, I will play pinball. I will play pinball. Uh, yeah, once or twice a Every week. Every once in a while. Okay. Every once in a while, because it's a quick, easy thing to you know just boot up, play yeah. a couple of rounds, and and then close it and go back to work. True that. Okay. Yeah, and I also have pinball arcade on my phone. So <laughs> okay. So, um, Pinball maybe was successful, Final Fantasy, The Spirits Within was not, because it bombs. That's right. The US release of Square's CGI magnum opus, Final Fantasy, The Spirits Within, has hit US theaters to a less than stellar reception. Coming in fourth on its opening weekend and making less than $12 million, the film would only go on to gross $85 million on an estimated budget of 130. It was a bad movie. It was a terrible freaking movie. It was god awful, and I should know I spent money to watch it in the theater. <laughs> okay. Money I didn't get back. They still owe me that money. But you did not time. walk out of it. I didn't walk out of it. It wasn't as bad as Max Payne. This is true. This is true. Because, boy, was that a terrible freaking movie. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, we just have to... Uh, yeah, we, we, talk we just about had that to in the audio this. version or in the video version? I can't remember if we talked about the Max Payne movie and which one. Huh. We've talked about that. And, okay. Um, yeah, uh, okay. Let's move on. I might even give it a go because... Oh, it's it's... Painfully bad. It is there. There's really no way to express just how loathsomely bad Mark Wahlberg is in that movie. Mm -hmm. And then to top it all off, they add like the supernatural element to it. Oh Lord. Oh yes. Oh Lord. Lord. Let's do do do. Let's move on. Let's move on. Let's yeah. just get way too much. Blizzard wins in Diablo dispute. Blizzard has successfully sued New Line Cinema, uh, no, sorry, New Line, uh, mo the movie production company, over their upcoming movie titled Diablo. The judge ruled that Blizzard had the rights to the title based on their game series. The decision would ultimately be overturned, but the film, starring Van Vin Diesel, would still be released under a different title, namely A Man Apart. Hmm. Okay, I mean, I haven't seen that, but oh you didn't well, Blizzard, me. lawsuits. <laughs> yeah, no, uh, it's, yeah, I mean, uh, nowadays it's all sorts of different problems that they have, but I thought that this was an interesting little tidbit just because the foundation of their argument was that they were hoping to make a Diablo movie. Okay. That, you know, it wasn't just going to be limited to video games mm -hmm. uh, and that this was going to be like a cross media, you know, experience or uh, property. And therefore mm -hmm. you had to the ju the judge had to give them the title Diablo for the movie because, yeah. you know, that's what they were going for. Obviously, no Diablo movie ever came about, and uh, the only Blizzard property so far turned into a movie was Warcraft, and, well, less said about that, the better. So, mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. I'm still waiting for my Lost Vikings movie. Come on, Blizzard. Lost Vikings the movie. Yeah, yeah you're not a Lost Vikings fan? No. No, but I wanted I didn't want to spoil uh, to destroy your excitement. Ah, uh, okay, I appreciate that. I, I really... wanted to give you some room. I wanted to okay. give you some room um to be excited because what comes now has never happened before in our podcast. We have a new section, guys, a new section. It's the section of death. <laughs> 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 yeah, yeah, I, and I knew you were going to enjoy this because, as longtime listeners know, P Peter has a very particular, uh, I don't want to call it a fetish, it's more of a, uh, a raison d'etre uh, to enjoy the deaths of companies uh, that we, uh, as we report them here on the show. And today we have not a double, not a triple, but a quadruple feature. Exactly. And, you know, I don't necessarily enjoy the death of a company. You know, it's actually a sad thing. Um, it's more like 
it's circle of life stuff, you know? Yeah, no, I I understand. I understand. It's it's uh, we all have to have our our little joys in life. Yeah, I, I I don't even know what to say to that because I think our oh, dear listeners will get a totally wrong impression from me. Anyhow, let me just enjoy those four topics, starting with Iron Storm Dallas shuts down. After much fanfare and countless dollars lost, John Romero's Ion Storm Dallas has shut its doors, producing only three games, Dominion, Anachronox, and of course, Daikatana, it would be survived for a few more years by the Austin office run by Warren Spector, as we talked about in our last 20-year jump. I mean, they were alive for quite a while, weren't they? Uh, they lasted a couple of years. Um, I mean, they weren't there that long. Uh, but it was a massive, it was a very large studio, had a lot of people. Mm-hmm. So that's where these three games came from. Um, let Let's move on with some blasphemy, the D side of God Games. Gathering of Developers, aka God Games, the Texas based publisher founded in 1998 by Michael Wilson and Harry Miller, have sold their company to Take Two, which will continue to publish games under the brand name for a few more years. Hmm. Do, I, um, do you think I know any games of those guys? Oh, God Games, uh, yeah, they did a whole bunch of stuff. Mm-hmm. Uh, I need to... I, I know. <laughs> they did a, a whole bunch of stuff that I can't remember for the hell of it. <laughs> dude, 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 it's, it's after midnight. You got to give me uh, a little bit here. Gathering of developers. I mean, no, no, no. They, they actually did a whole, uh, bunch of interesting stuff. Uh, so here. Uh, da, 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 da. Sorry. No problem. That, uh, so the original guys, uh, they've got credits for Railroad Tycoon 2, Jazz Jack Rabbit 2. Uh, they, I mean, they were a publisher also of a bunch of stuff. Rune is a big one. Age of Wonders, Darkstone, uh, the Fly Games, uh, Kiss Psycho Circus. Much, yeah, it's not necessarily a game we need to talk about, but uh, Heavy Metal Fact Two. That was another weird one. Max Payne. Uh, that is actually, I think, going to be either they were the original publisher of it and then Take Two takes over and puts it under the Rockstar label, or they uh, were the uh, the uh, the actual label that uh, Take Two used. One second, let me check the back cover of the box. And yeah, 3D Realms produced by and published by God Games. So they were the publisher of the game. 3D Realms was the producer and Remedy was the developer. I think I mistakenly may have said earlier that Take Two or Rockstar were it, but Rockstar is then involved with part two and part three. So yeah. So Max Payne is one of their games. So an an important company in that regard and yeah like i said uh, they're they're going to keep the name around for a couple more years uh but you know it's it's really just a sub label at that point uh, mafia another big game also gets published under their title uh and if you haven't played a mafia i definitely uh recommend doing that that's a great game and uh, interestingly enough, the founders would go on to create other companies, including Devolver Games, oh, okay. which is a really cool indie uh, publisher. And big titles like Mafia and Max Payne uh, get published under this label. So, yeah. Yeah. yeah uh, I mean, Devolver is, is known. Devolver isn't. It's someone you know. Exactly. Exactly. They're out there and they've done a lot of really cool stuff. So. There you go. Uh, the The guys had a an interesting idea, an interesting approach to publishing, 
and uh, Take Two has taken notice. Um, yeah, moving on, and for some weird reason, I have to think of little gecko. Maybe you can explain that to me, because Dynamics is no more. A gecko? I have no idea why you're thinking of a gecko. No, I'm thinking of the game Gex for some reason. I don't know why I connected with Dynamics. Oh, yeah, no, that's Crystal Dynamics. Ah, there you go. Yeah, that's why. And Crystal Dynamics has nothing to do with this Dynamics, because it's also spelled differently. Yeah, uh, so rumors have been circulating for a while that Sierra would be closing Dynamics. After the release of Tribes 2, much of the development staff was let go, and now, finally, the rest of the company will be dissolved with support for Tribes moving to the Bellevue offices. Mm-hmm. So, <laughs> the death of Sierra is foreshadowed. Uh... Yeah, yeah. I mean, Sierra is no, not long for this world either, uh, I mean, if you that whole epic, uh, go and check out my interview with uh, Ken Williams. Yeah. And I also have an upcoming interview with the co-founder of Dynamics, but he's already long gone from the company by the time this happens. Mm-hmm. And uh, yeah, Tribes, uh, the 3D engine behind Tribes will live on. Um mm-hmm. We've already talked about that also in a previous episode, how uh, Jeff Tunnell, the other co-founder of the company, had already left and he took uh, the technology with him to uh, start a company called Gearbox, where he was going to be licensing it out. Ah, okay. And uh, yeah, so Sierra is slowly closing down, but Dynamics had never actually moved to Seattle, where the rest of, or the main parts of Sierra were, it had always remained in Oregon. And so, yeah, the fact that they're moving the support for tribes over to the Bellevue offices is literally just, you know, closing down what's left in Oregon at this point. Oh, Oh, well, I mean, some things are better left behind. And now for the final topic of today. And I have no idea how to pronounce that. Michael Crichton. Thank you. Michael Crichton closes timeline. You never heard Michael Crichton? Uh, Jurassic Park. Oh. Okay. Congo. Yeah, yeah. Okay. 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 okay gotcha. Uh, Eaters of the Dead. Uh, great. A great novel. Uh, the game studio built around mega author Michael Crichton, Timeline Computer Entertainment, has closed its doors. Having launched only one title, the eponymous Timeline, which failed to achieve either critical nor commercial success, the studio has closed its doors. And I said closed its doors twice. Ah, it's getting late. I mean, maybe they had two doors. (laughs) Oh, probably. But I still didn't have to say it twice. Should have used a different uh, phrase at this point. Wasn't nice. He said it twice. (laughs) Okay. There you go. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, uh, and Timeline is a very weird company uh, that seemed to think that just because they had the name, it was going to work. Uh, for more information on them, uh, they were a topic of discussion in my interview with American McGee because he right. was actually brought in there for a little while to try to uh, get this project working, and he talks about it uh, quite frankly. It's uh, very interesting. I'll put a int- uh, link to my interview with him in the show notes so you guys can check that out. Uh, but yeah, so Timeline is another company. It was an attempt, I guess, almost a sequel to the old bookware concept where publishers were getting into the creation and publishing of computer software in the early 80s. But uh, this, yeah, this was basically trying to be, you know, around one author. Now, this concept would work later on with people like Tom Clancy getting a whole mess of games with his Red Storm uh, label that I believe now. uh, Yeah, we talked about how it got sold to Ubisoft. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, it can be done, but... uh, with Michael Crichton, it was not going to work. Some things are, ju- are better to just be finished, you know? 
Yeah, yeah. And I think one of those things is this episode. Exactly. Curious. Oh, nice transition. Well yeah. done. Well done. You've been away, but you haven't lost your touch. Yeah. So, uh, Peter, that does mean we have one order of business. The yep. word of the episode. The word of the episode. Uh, <laughs> I want to use late night. <laughs> For some reason. <laughs> Uh, Sorry, what did you say after I want to use late night? Yeah, no, just for some reason I want to use late night. And yeah, let's go with that. Okay, late night it is. Late night it and is. And with that, uh, remember, dear listeners, you can catch us on the socials, the Instagram, and the Twitter. The and you Patreon. can email us with questions, comments, suggestions at video game newsroom time machine at gmail.com. Uh, also, you know, contact us on Patreon and support us on Patreon because, you know, that's that's a nice thing to do. And uh, I got nothing else. Uh, do you have anything, Peter? So if you want to donate some money for Carl to buy some new headphones, <laughs> in desperate need of headphones yes, he is in desperate that's... need of headphones and alternatively you can just make a photograph of some nice landscapes around you and send it to us yeah there you go <laughs> okay <laughs> all righty um i think this is that's it for today isn't it that's it that's it we're that's gonna it. head out and uh Next time, we'll be traveling back again 40 years to October of 1981. Peter, have fun. Yep, bye. <laughs>